Well, I had a lot of people over the 18 years of rumination, and I thought, thought about writing this book. A lot of authors come to, came to me and asked uh, to write it uh, with me or for me, and uh, I waited for the right one. And uh, Julie Sherman came along, and uh, after looking at her work and uh, talking to her, I concluded that uh, what I really needed was the, a woman's feel, a woman's touch. Uh, war is about men, and men take life, but the end horrible result about war is uh, it takes the life of young men in the main, and it's the sons, the, daughter, the daughters, the husbands of, of women. Women give life. And uh, I felt that if we could discuss war and, and discuss it with that man's passion from, from my own experience, but with the sensitivity uh, and that depth and feeling of a woman, we could tell the complete story. Oh, probably a half dozen. Uh, there were a number of, of uh, that qualified people that came to me. Uh, but I wanted, I wanted also to, to ensure that uh, I had my head together so my, the message that I was going to give uh, would be clear and would be objective and would be without bitterness and vindictiveness and the, uh, the, the need to uh, even the score. Well, in 1971, I said that uh, to the nation that uh, Vietnam was a bad war and I said it was from my heart, uh, from the experiences of uh, almost six years, uh, over a six year period in Vietnam, uh, that it was a bad war, we were losing it, we were bleeding unnecessarily, and there was just simply no way we were going to win it, nor our uh, people that we were involved with, the South Vietnamese, were going to win it, and we should get out now. And what I didn't realize that when you sound off uh, against a, a big institution like the U.S. Army and say they're all wrong, I didn't realize what happened to whistleblowers, and I got thumped about the head and shoulders in a very severe way, and that created the bitterness, and uh, that that caused me to uh, leave America, leave my roots, and go to Australia and uh, be angry for a long time. You know, in 1966, I told the Army Chief of Staff, Harold K. Johnson, we were losing the war. And in 1968, I wrote in a, in a paper which went to General Westmoreland uh, that we had botched the war. The following year, in 69, I told the Secretary of the Army, Stanley Reeser, that we were losing the war. Pretty evident where I was coming from, but nothing was done. I took a drafty battalion full, uh, full of untrained kids in 69 and turned them into a Praetorian Guard that just turned the battlefield around, and at the end of a five month period, we'd killed 2,500 enemy at the loss of 25 of my men, a 100 to 1 ratio. We were fighting the war as the war should have been fought, but no one listened. No general came down and said, Gee, how did you guys do this? How did these untrained troopers? win battles like this time and time again because uh, we didn't want to learn. The, the government, the army specifically, has no real deep uh, uh, reflection. Uh, they just don't look at the past to, to, to learn from it, to grow from it. And I think that's the thing that as it built up, this frustration caused me to I reflect that my sounding off in 71, I tried it through the system. I told everybody in the Army that would listen to me. When I realized that that wasn't going to happen, I went to the people uh, uh, via the media and, and told them the truth of what was happening in Vietnam. And I had been in the Merchant Marine for a year before, so I had merchant papers from my experience in the Pacific. And uh, so I used those as uh, documents to get me in the Army. I was an orphan, so it was... Uh, uh, it was, the Army became a home for me, Brian. It became a, a, uh, uh, my family. It was something I loved very, very much. So I was very protective t towards this institution. And I always loved my soldiers because I was a soldier. And I wanted to keep them alive. I believed uh, in winning battles and, and fighting wars. And I was a warrior, but not at the expense of my men. So I think that great love for my soldiers was the thing, too, that made me stand up and, and shout, stop the madness. I would, from certain circles, certainly the Army magazine and the institution would endorse what I have to say. Uh, but uh, I think in the book is the truth. And I think that those people who are writing the reviews, uh, uh, most of them had been on the battlefield, had gone through that same experience as I. And uh, they're just seeing somebody finally 
coming out in a in a in a real detailed form and offering what happened in Vietnam. And it just wasn't from Vietnam. All this tragedy that occurred started in 1946 when we took our officer corps and started this business of making everybody a diplomat and a warrior. And and it, which ended up under Maxwell Taylor when he became chief of staff. Our generals became corporate generals rather than the fighting generals of the type that won World War II, the Ridgeways and the Pattons and so on. But I think it's in the, his, the living history of the U.S. military. Uh, what do I think of medals? I think that uh, Napoleon said, uh, if you have enough ribbon, you can conquer the world. And I think you have to honor your warriors for uh, standing up and being counted, uh, for moving into the fire, across the killing zone, and you honor them with a piece of ribbon. And, uh, and at the end of World War II, the household uh, name was Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy had, what, nine ribbons, the Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Service Cross, the Purple Heart, Silver Star, Bronze Star, and so on. They were all awards for feats on the battlefield. During the Korean War, there was a fellow right here in Washington, D.C., named, uh, lives now, named Scooter Burke, Lloyd Leslie Burke, who won all the medals that Audie Murphy won. He never received any recognition because that war, the Korean War, was not a glorious war. We didn't win it. It wasn't, uh, there wasn't any Berlins or Tokyos or so on. And the same thing from the Vietnam War. Uh, those kids that won awards for attacking a machine gun or saving a comrade uh, were uh, certainly to be honored and to be recognized. But there were so many others that were the, the self-serving careerist general officers and colonels and so on, who used the award thing to get an award simply to so it looked good on his, on his uh, jacket, which uh, would cause someone to think he was a warrior. And you look at, you know, take Admiral Crow, uh, who is the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. On his jacket, it's ablaze with medals and so on, 31 of them, but there's not one for a combat deed. They're all having been their awards, you're a good guy award, you move some paper across your desk in a neat way award. Take Oliver North, who's in the hot seat as we talk. He uh, has 14 awards on his chest, uh, but only three for combat, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart. Uh, the rest are having been their awards, and he appears in front of Congress, and the American people think, hey, this is a warrior. Just like when Admiral Crow, perhaps, appears in front of Congress, those are his credentials, and those congressmen don't know they're just having been their awards. When he says, we need this, they believe that he knows what he's talking about from the standpoint of being on a battlefield. So I think that we've, we've kind of uh, put our award system at a cross pr uh, purpose. Granada, there were 7,000 men on that island. They gave 8,000 awards. There were 200 enemy Cuban soldiers and so on on that island. And they gave 200 awards for valor, one per enemy soldier. So this is stretching it a bit far, Brian. And I think we need to go back and clean up our act on awards and just give awards to soldiers. The final line on awards is, to me, the only award that is a today, because it's been considerably prostituted, that really means something to warriors is the Purple Heart, and above that, the combat infantry badge. That means I've been there. In Vietnam, there were 100 infantry battalions. Of that 100 battalions, there were 1,600 rifle platoons. So of the 550,000 men that fought in Vietnam, that were in Vietnam, that served in Vietnam, only 50,000 men were infantry out fighting the enemy, and every time they put their foot down, they didn't know whether they were going to have a foot, a leg, or a life. So I think that uh, we have to look at medals in the military and in Vietnam from that viewpoint, that uh, uh, it's become a big corporation rather than a fighting institution. And uh, I think we need to return our military uh, to a, uh, an organization that can serve and defend our country without all these games people play. See, I was a little kid uh, in Korea, uh, was a squad leader of an F3 squad, and uh, I was flushing out a sniper, and uh, he, st he got me first, and uh, the bullet struck me in the back of the head and came, uh, came out uh, uh, under the skin of the back and uh, knocked me on my, my tail. And, uh, and I thought I was dead, ringing in the ear and so on. And I, uh, my buddy that was with me that was covering me thought I was dead with blood spurting everywhere. And it, it may have knocked me out, I don't know. But when I, when I came to my senses, I was by myself and I uh, 
crawled out of there. It was way out in front of the, the, the uh, enemy lines, and we had just killed three uh, enemy a machine gun crew on the, on the way, and, I, and I, to way to get to this position where I was firing at the sniper, and I uh, had to crawl over these three fellas, and I knew they'd be alive, and I, in panic, had dropped my weapon, uh, so I, I finally uh, crawled over them and got back to the American lines and, and was patched up and back to the hospital. And, and, uh, and I wanted to return because I wanted to get back to, uh, to my unit. Because it was my, again, that point that I brought out earlier, it was my family, the guys I really love. And there's no bonding like that on the battlefield, that among combat infantrymen. One time I was lying in a position and we were being shelled and my platoon sergeant flung his arm over my back and a shell exploded right next to us. And the platoon sergeant said, oh, I'm hit. And, uh, and uh, when things settled down, we started, what you normally do is start checking out your body because things are thumping up against your dirt and so on. And just check out if you've been wounded. And I realized I hadn't. And I said, well, let's get out here. And Greer found that his arm was nailed to my back. And uh, uh, the shrapnel had gone through his arm and nailed it to my back, so we had to prise his arm from my back. So that was one that you know that I, I wouldn't forget. Uh, another time was on uh, in Korea again uh, in uh, 1951, uh, 4 November. Uh, uh, I had a hand grenade blow up uh, uh, underneath me, and it blew me way up in the air and flung me down on the ground and tore my arm almost off. And uh, uh, and I thought I was going to die, and a sergeant named Jack Speed from Memphis, Tennessee came running up, and he said, well, the old man's dead, he says. And I thought, never am I going to die on this hill. And I got up enough strength and walked down to where the dock was patching people up. So you don't forget those experiences. And, uh, and it, they all kind of happen in slow motion, Brian. Uh, you recall the whole thing. It's, and it's something that's like all of us have been at one time or another in danger of some sort, in an accident with a car, and you see that car, uh, and that's the way combat is. I think when it comes to the time where you're in the, the utmost danger, your whole system slows down where you're recording every microsecond of it. Well, on the battlefield, you're uh, frightened all the time, and you live with it, and the beauty of being a leader, of being a squad leader, a platoon sergeant, company commander, and so on, was you were busy. You were looking after your your troops, shepherding your herd, so to speak. You were calling in artillery fire, bringing in air, maneuvering your unit, talking on the radio, and you simply didn't have time to be as concerned as that warrior is who's just waiting behind a wall for someone to say, let's get up and go. So that's the, the, the real problem. And, the, and another problem is the brighter you are, the more imagination you have. One of the things from Vietnam, is this Vietnam stress syndrome, is that those kids endured something that the American soldier in the history of our country from 1776 forward didn't experience in battle, and that was that minute-to-minute -minute experience of walking through a, uh, a field laced with booby traps that were carefully camouflaged. You know that 50 percent of all casualties in Vietnam came from mines and booby traps. And, uh, and I think that that business, for th if, if you were lucky to survive for the 365 days that our infantry fought in Vietnam, that would sear your mind. And, uh, and I think that that is one of the, the causes of a lot of disturbances of, uh, among the men that fought in Vietnam. Well, it took five years, Brian, five long years. And, and what uh, Julie and I first did was uh, worked out a game plan. We decided to tape every uh, experience that I had. And that, before the taping, uh, this is audio tape, uh, before the taping, we took all of the documents, the notebooks, the papers, the things I had saved throughout my 25-year military experience. And we'd compartmentalized that in 18 chapters. Well, that we assumed, we envisioned we would be writing 18 chapters. And uh, maybe it was a notebook, a little, little uh, uh, small book I'd carried in Korea, which had only six or seven lines in it, or a letter from a friend, or a letter that I had sent home that was saved by my brother or my sister-in-law or someone. And uh, once we'd once we'd organized those 18 boxes of, uh, of information, then we went through those and recorded those experiences. And then that became a transcript of about this high, of about uh, 
uh, 57 tapes worth, and uh, then Julie went through that and set out what the story was. And then she would write a chapter and give me the chapter. Uh, I would rewrite the chapter. While she was doing two, I would be doing one. And uh, then from that, names would fall out. We only started with about three or four names, and we ended up with almost 400 people that contributed to the book, uh, which made the book alive in that we were drawing on the experiences on the memories of a lot of other warriors and uh, so I was like then by the end of the book uh, driving the truck and there were 300 odd guys in the back of the truck whose voices we could use and, 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 and added to the wealth and the knowledge uh, uh, that's contained in the book and the accuracy too because your memory is a funny thing and on the battlefield too you can only see over the sights of your rifle so you don't see the big picture and we wanted to tell the big picture uh, as, as best we could so then uh, these chapters would go back and forth and we'd integrate the input from the letters from the people that we were tracing down and we'd crank their stuff into it and then the thing would be rewrite, rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. Some chapters were written 20 times and uh, so that put a big strain on Julie and I. Uh, there's a thing, that, uh, Julie's a screenwriter, not a book writer. And uh, there's a thing in her trade called abandon. You just get so much information. And in my case, I was so passionate about the subject because I felt the book would cause people to learn, the book would cause people not to make those horrible mistakes again. So I wanted to get every little detail in. So I might, for example, one chapter, which is called The Wolfhounds, which deals with Korea, 1950 and 51 and early 52. Uh, when it was completely done, locked in concrete, I would gotten some information from the National Archives that really lent a lot of information to the, that particular chapter. And, uh, uh, and I went to Julie and said, look, golly, this is great stuff. We need to put it in. And uh, she felt that we'd had reached a point of abandonment on that chapter. And so we had that kind of friction, a give and take friction, to get the book uh, together and get it done correctly supported by three or four visits to the United States by Julie, where she went and interviewed the people that we had tracked down in their hometown. So she traveled all over America, uh, recording people's comments and collecting data and so on. So we tried to make the, the, the book as complete as, and accurate as possible. Why did Julie have this kind of time? Is this a full-time job? We made it a full-time job. We decided that it was such an important message that, uh, that, you know, the war has changed so significantly from the time that, say, my ancestors came to America in 1622 and landed at James City and they were firing old musket weapons at, at the Indians and the Indians were fighting, firing bows and arrow, arrows back at them. And, uh, but by the time I was to leave the military, we had awesome weapons in our inventory that one alone could bring about the destruction of humankind. We, we saw what Chernobyl brought about. Well, that would, if Chernobyl was a bomb that was on a submarine or an, or an airplane or at the end of a, of a missile, it would be a very small one in what the Soviets and the Americans and, and, the, and the English and so on have in their inventory. So I felt that we had to bring out the point that, that, that through our story of war is no longer probably the means to resolve conflict. We've got to find a new way to do it. And that's kind of the, one of the bottom lines of the book. Uh, the, the advance was small because Simon and Schuster uh, didn't know us from Adam. We had never written a book before of any significance. And uh, so the advance was, was really small. And uh, uh, Julie dipped into her savings. And luckily, I was retired Army, so I had a, my little magic blue check coming in every month. Uh, but I think that's an error, and I'm glad you're going to correct it uh, to the nation. Uh, I uh, did do well, uh, but I don't, didn't do well in, in those kind of numbers. I used my military experience and my military training, which I found that were very uh, appropriate and applicable to civilian life. If you thought things out and made your decisions rationally and logically, uh, it was very easy to be a success. So I used my military training and, and uh, running restaurants and establishing a duck farm and, and so on. And, and uh, I found that civilian life is a piece of cake. I think an important part of this, which I didn't understand, uh, last May, my son graduated from school and I came to 
to his graduation in Berkeley. And uh, at the same time, brought the manuscript back, the final manuscript, to Simon and & Schuster. And uh, then I left there and went out to Montana to, to, to spend a few days with my best friend. And uh, I suddenly realized that I wanted to come home, that the book had had such a cathartic effect on me, such a healing effect, uh, such a purging effect that uh, uh, it had taken all of the bitterness out. It had taken all of the, the uh, need to uh, strike out and get revenge for what happened. And, uh, uh, and I realized that I wanted to return home and uh, return to my roots. And in, in this score, from that parade piece, uh, I've received hundreds of letters, and many of the, the people writing those letters had uh, also uh, read the book because the, the article told about the book. And so many Vietnam veterans, so many uh, wives of soldiers that were killed in Vietnam, parents of soldiers who were killed in Vietnam, uh, wrote to me and said that the book had a healing effect for them. And I'm really thrilled with this, that here maybe we've explained what happened. And now to parents who over all of these years have thought, my God, uh, why did my son die? And what were the circumstances? And once, as one lieutenant wrote to me, he said, now I understand. Uh, I felt so guilty over all of these years that I was the one who told men to die and they followed my orders. And I realized that I was fighting in a, in a bad war, maybe in an unjust war, in a war that perhaps my country shouldn't have been in in the first place. So I'm glad that that kind of message is coming out of it because that's the kind of uh, effect it's had on me, Brian. I think in Montana or Colorado, some, some place up high where I can be out in the country. I like, I like the uh, wilderness and uh, I'm not into the big cities. I, I couldn't sleep from all the noise because I live in Australia on top of a little hill all by myself uh, and when I hear a car coming down the, the, uh, the road, they're coming to see me and I don't hear that many cars coming down the road. So to suddenly to be thrust in New York City where they're collecting the, the garbage at midnight and there's crash, bang, boom, uh, it was like living on a battlefield. So I'll, I'll live uh, probably uh, up in the hills where my family came from. The, the, so I I'm re really have this passion to return to my roots. Ward Just is uh, a writer. He wrote for Newsweek, Washington Post. Uh, he's now a novelist and a very good one. And Ward Just had a profound influence on my life. Uh, it started with uh, in June of 1966 during the Battle of Dok Tho, uh, Ward was with one of my platoons, a reconnaissance platoon that found themselves in a very tough firefight deep into uh, enemy positions. And uh, they were surrounded and had a, a great number of casualties. And Ward uh, was wounded in this action. And that night, we, we couldn't get to, the, to this uh, besieged unit uh, uh, with infantry to reinforce them. We were working towards that end. Uh, and they had, uh, the unit had eight seriously wounded men and who in the terms of the medic that was on the ground uh, reckoned they wouldn't make it till uh, first light when we could get them out with choppers. So we got an all-volunteer Air Force chopper crew that flew over the battlefield, took a lot of fire, but winched them out. And well, I thought that this reporter would come out too. Uh, and he refused, and he gave up his seat so a, a fellow in his judgment who was more severely wounded come, could get out. He stayed on the ground, stayed surrounded, and so on. When he had a free ticket out, which was so on a tip, he won me for life, and he joined the Brotherhood. He joined the, the Brotherhood of Infantrymen. And when the fight was over, I went to the hospital. I awarded him the combat infantry badge. I took him a rifle that we had captured in the fight, a, a Chinese rifle and uh, he became my friend for life. And then, coincidentally, I was from that assignment assigned to the Pentagon right here in this city. And uh, as was Ward, he became the Washington Post military correspondent. So we dealt a lot together, and I uh, learned from him. And he wrote his very brilliant book, To What End? And he asked me to review the manuscript. 
And I, then I realized the war wasn't only a, a war of tactics and, and strategy, but a war of winning the people to the side of the government of South Vietnam. And there were so many other uh, political implications other than the wham-bam the, of the battlefield. And so Ward became my teacher and, and, and it caused me to kind of wake up. And uh, uh, so that I knew that he had the sensitivity to, to write an introduction that would uh, uh, really tell what our book was all about. Well, I think that, that uh, there are a lot of arguments about what happened at Incheon. Uh, me, meanwhile, back at the Pusan perimeter, uh, we were getting stronger and stronger, so we were about to break out anyway, and he took an enormous risk uh, to employ uh, uh, the forces that he did uh, against the recommendations of the Navy, of the Marine Corps. Uh, it was a very daring thing to do, and it might have been a desperate thing to do. Uh, I think what happened to General MacArthur was he became a law unto himself. I think that he, he uh, had developed to the point where he didn't have to follow orders. And, and this, the thing about a soldier is you must follow orders. And I think that we experienced that with MacArthur at a much lower level. We experienced it with Oliver North, uh, his failure to follow the Constitution, his failure to follow the uh, instructions that he received, the law. And it, once you go beyond the law, when you've got uh, military forces at your disposal, uh, our only purpose as soldiers is to defend this country. And when you start uh, doing uh, things on your own, uh, you're violating your charter, a soldier that followed the rules. But there's a difference between breaking an army regulation than breaking a law of our country and violating the Constitution. And that's why when I became so frustrated over what was happening in Vietnam, uh, I didn't shred the Constitution. I stood and took the message to the people because I believed, and this was the thing that hurt me, that we were a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people, and what our nation was all about was exactly that. And uh, that's the thing that I found scary, that the people were asleep and the people were not in charge, and they left the running of our government to the generals, to the politicians, to the president, and so on. And I think that uh, they, those cats need us to tell them what to do. And if we think they're in charge, uh, 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 we're making a mistake, because this country should be ran by the people, and that's what democracy is all about. You said earlier that the, the generals take their orders from the civilians, the soldier takes his order from the boss. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. how can you have a successful war if the generals aren't running the show? Well, it's a prerequisite of the general, the guy in charge, to ensure that uh, if he's in a war, that he's, he's fighting the war as effectively, as frugally, as... Uh, brilliantly and swiftly as possible. The whole key to war is not a very complicated thing. It's get there firstest with the mostest. You've got the initiative on your side. What has happened uh, in our military is that, uh, that since 1946, we've become, uh, uh, our generals have removed themselves from the war. Uh, they've become as I said earlier, corporate generals. They become people who are involved in the politics of things uh, rather than the war of things. And in becoming politicians, they're, they've developed kind of a go-along to get-along attitude. And now this is wrong. What, what a general should do, if I am your general and you have tasked me to fight in Vietnam, let's use that situation, then I would say, Mr. President, you realize that the security of our country is not at stake there. Why are we fighting there? And you'd say, well, we've got to contain communism there. And then I would argue that perhaps we wouldn't be containing communism there. But if you said, General, it's my instructions that you will fight there. I'd say, right, sir, I will deploy my forces accordingly. Now, I need to fight there 12 divisions of infantry. I want to 
deploy them simultaneously, and I need to destroy the, the port of Haipyeong, I need to destroy the, the, the dikes in the Red River Delta, I need to destroy Sunukville, the port, I need to uh, destroy all of the enemy sanctuaries, and the president would say, well, we can't al allow you to have those divisions, we won't allow you to use your navy to blockade and destroy Haipyeong, and then, I, then it is and like the, the the Sergeant York uh, divisional and anti-aircraft system, which cost two billion dollars, was quietly folded up because it didn't work. But after the taxpayer had, had spent that kind of money, so it, if you had generals who knew what the hell they were doing, you wouldn't have these problems. So what we've got to inculcate, and what our Congress has to do, and they're at fault in this whole military procurement thing too, is they've got to insist that uh, we produce those kind of people, and those are the kind of people that we put stars on their shoulders, that, that the fighters from the past, not the writers from the present and the future. The generals simply can't say, I won't do that, but they'll give the reasons why. Then they're willing, in the European sense, to resign if, if, it's, if it's not done correctly. Uh, but we, we have developed uh, a system of selection of our generals that you must have a master's degree, you must have gone to the war college and have you been to Harvard and have you had all of these different experiences so by the time you are a general you've forgotten what it is to lead troops and we'll take Westmoreland for example who I think was a great corporate general on the battlefield of Europe he would have probably been another Eisenhower he's a good man I'm not saying that he's a bad man but he was the wrong fellow for that show uh, in Vietnam but if, if you take a guy like like Westmoreland uh, his whole background is one of, of an administrator uh, certainly he had the cursory uh, 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 command experiences, but he didn't know what was going on the ground. His background was he was an artilleryman. Uh, he had never been in an infantry platoon, in an infantry company, in an infantry battalion in his life, but yet he was the leader of a war which was purely an infantry war fought at those levels. So he was, it was like uh, a car designer that had never driven a car. And uh, many of our divisions were commanded in Vietnam by those type people who simply didn't know their trade. They may have at one time, and I think one of the problems is most of the generals in Vietnam were the young colonels of World War II, the best and the brightest. And uh, by the time they were 23, 24 years old, they were a lieutenant colonel. Today, a fellow who's 23 years old is a lieutenant, and he'll probably be a lieutenant for a couple more years. So he's getting a lot of experience at platoon level. Patton said an officer wasn't worth a pinch of salt until he had 10 years with troops. And, uh, but our, our soldiers and our officers and leaders today don't get that kind of experience. I think today, right now, 1989, the Army has recognized this. Now, I've just been to the 7th Division, uh, the 25th Division, and the National Training Center out at uh, Fort Irwin. And I've talked to the young leaders, and these people are good. And, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and, the, and the battalion commanders that I spoke to had been at, with their battalions a long time and were eminently qualified. And I think where it happens is once they leave battalion and they become a bird colonel or above, that's where the corruption begins. And uh, then these are the fellows who become the generals and, and, and they're the ones who go along to get along and won't stand in the door. If you've just joined us, we're talking with retired Colonel David Hackworth. This is his book. It's called About Face, the Odyssey of an American Warrior, co-authored with Julie Sherman have a great love for this institution because it, uh, it was my home, it, it looked after me, and I just want to make sure that we never repeat the mistakes of the past. That's hard to say, and I don't have a crystal ball. I don't think that, I don't think you'll see a war between superpowers. I think that both the Soviet Union and the United States realize that, that the destructive powers that, the, that they, they have at the end of their cannons is so, so mind-boggling that it would destroy, uh, destroy the, their countries and it would destroy the world. If somebody so, told... I, but I do think, if I just sure. finish that, I do think that we will see wars of, of national liberation similar to what we had in, in, in uh, 
Vietnam. I think we'll see wars in Latin America. Latin America is exploding. And uh, I think that 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 is where our strategic interest was really threatened. And uh, I think that we need forces who know how to deal with that. And more important, we need diplomats right here in your city who can solve the matter without conflict, who can solve the matter through uh, programs of education and, and uh, uh, stopping this whole gringo thing of the, of the arrogant yank coming in and, and uh, uh, taking advantage of somebody that doesn't have the good things that we have. I think that uh, I was there in 1950, 51, 52. I went to Fort Benning for, uh, in 1952. It's kind of like a, a mid-level course on infantry, which went from uh, the company to regiment. And then I went back to Korea, 52 to 53. 65 through uh, all of 65, 66, uh, 60, part of 67, then 69, 70, and, and half of 71. It's a very, very good question because in Korea, we made a lot of a lot of mistakes. We simply we went there with the view that, well, here comes Uncle Sam. We've just kicked the Japs and the the Germans' tail, and we anybody gets in our way, uh, it was like John Wayne and the Top Gun type thing. Uh, better stand aside. And we thought our presence would would stop the North Koreans, uh, as we did the same in Vietnam, as we did recently in Lebanon. Our presence would would cool things off, and. Uh, we sent an army that was badly trained, badly led by a lot of tired old men, and badly equipped that hadn't been trained for the battlefield. And uh, we made a lot of mistakes, and the things didn't turn around until we got a leader, Ridgeway. And when General Walker was killed, Ridgeway took over, and he turned one of the most uh, important uh, events of military history, how one man can take a defeated army and turn it around. And that's why leadership is threaded through this discussion so much. If you got the right leader, you can get the job done. He was on the battlefield. He knew his trade, he, meaning he knew what, uh, what the tactics were about. He knew what strategy was about. And he was not afraid Truman at that time when things were not going right. I never knew him personally, but I've admired him. And I served under his command, and of course, in the 8th Army. The most would be a rifle company, a couple hundred men. I talked to my soldiers. I was there. I would never give an order that, that, that I wouldn't do myself. And, uh, and I love my soldiers. I never wasted them. They, they knew that. And uh, uh, we, we were, formed a very perfect team. I was very hard on them, meaning I, I was like a father that, uh, that uh, uh, took his children and, and laid a, a, a very disciplined trip on them. But we were not playing in the backyard. We were playing in a life and death game. And if I could train them where they were uh, competent and confident, then I knew they could make it through the night in the most horrible experience uh, that a human can endure, and that's being an infantryman on the battlefield when shells are crashing in, booby traps are exploding, machine guns are ripping away. So it's, it's, a, it's a one big raging atrocity, Brian. Now, I always led from the front. And, and that was Ridgeway's way. The delta of Vietnam, when I took over a battalion that was so badly trained, it was filled with draftees and bad leadership and so on, that I virtually had to become a squad leader again, meaning I virtually had to lead from the front. But as soon as I got them trained up, I got back to where I could command. You know, you really can't uh, fight uh, a battalion or a brigade by playing squad leader. You got to get back and, and look at the battle and see it, see it from an overview point. But there's always a time that you've got to go and understand the pulse of it. You just got to grab onto the pulse of the fight and to find out what's going on. The, the great generals of history, the, the Jacksons and the Rommels and the Ridgeways and the Gavins and so on, were guys who led from the front, not from their helicopter as was in Vietnam, or not from the command and control bunker that's in the Pentagon. He was my company commander in Korea for a while, and I uh, worked with him in the Delta, and I, uh, as a guy I admired a great deal. Why? When he was, was killed, uh, and I flew around one of those planes too, but I wasn't reluctant to land the damn thing and get on the ground and lead my troops, nor was John Paul Van. Uh, he was a doer, a shaker, and a, and a, and a, uh, a maker, and uh, I, I liked him, and I, I thought he was a good man. Goes into his uh, personal background, and uh, 
I don't know if I cared for all of that, but I didn't write the book. That's up for to Neil Sheehan uh, to say what he had to say. But I, th I think that I enjoyed the book very much, and I think that our book certainly dovetails very neatly with it as a companion piece. Because we're talking about the war from the standpoint of the U.S., where that was the Vietnamese side, even though we have uh, of one strong chapter that deals with Arvin and the Vietnamese and... and uh, uh, from my uh, almost uh, two plus years experience working as an advisor at brigade and division and, and special zone level in Vietnam with the Vietnamese. Done uh, by screaming and yelling, uh, I think that uh, by setting the example, uh, by uh, winning their confidence, letting them know that you're not a butcher, that you love them, that you're going to care for them, and uh, uh, reckoned that their defensive positions w wouldn't hack it. If they, we were tapped, if the enemy hit us, uh, we'd, we'd be in serious trouble. So my first order after taking over the unit was, by midnight, I want us to be fall, fall back 300 yards. I want new positions dug. And, and I want all this junk taken out. There was, there was uh, uh, Cokes and, and uh, soft drinks and little containers on position. The men slept in cots. Uh, the, 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 the weapons were rusty. The ammunition was in the mud. It was just simply not a professional military organization. It was an organization that had been blooded for six months, and they were just waiting for a disaster. So I fell them back. They dug in their, no, uh, their, their new holes, got their new positions together with a lot of grumbling. Who is this new guy? That G they were calling me G.I. Joe who's going to uh, change this thing around and blow our nice, soft life apart. And uh, the, uh, exactly at midnight that night, as if I would have planned it, we got hit with everything that the enemy could throw at us, with rockets and with artillery and fire of all sorts. And the men went to their defensive position. And now I had been away from troops, uh, from combat troops, okay? I had a battalion at Fort uh, Lewis. Uh, just before I came to Vietnam on this tour, but I'd been away from the war for a couple years, and, and I was nervous as Nelly, you know, I was grabbed the radio, I thought, geez, I hope I don't blow this thing. Here's with all my combat experience. So you can imagine these dilettantes that came in who hadn't been with troops for 10 or 15 years and took a battalion, okay? Uh, and uh, as I was a adjusting artillery and calling in air and getting flare ships and all these good things you do in, under those circumstances, a young lieutenant ran by to go into his fighting position and he said that I knew what I was doing. And if we had more people in Vietnam that knew what they were doing, uh, I think the outcome of that war at the tactical level on the battlefield would have been a lot different. We, we would have come out with, with real honor rather than the, the, the Kissinger peace with honor meaning where we sold out our allies. Oh, sure, there's Jim Musselman, Johnny Howard, uh, Jim Mukiyama, uh, kids that I knew who were young lieutenants, young majors, and so on. Don Hilbert right here in your city. They've got a lot of uh, very competent guys. I'm very pleased with the, uh, the uh, number of the generals that I know that I've soldiered with. Glenn Mallory, uh, I, could, and I could name probably a dozen. So I think, I think that uh, the somebody who's picking generals or picking the kind of guys who will stand in the door and uh, who'll give us, uh, uh, who bring back that warrior leader spirit that we had in this country before the Pattons and the Ridgeways. I had uh, a lot of time to ruminate about it, and uh, it was a hell of a decision because I knew I was cutting my throat in terms of the military. I knew I was all washed up if I sounded off. Uh, but I felt it was necessary that I did, and so I did my homework, and I, uh, meaning I knew I was going to talk about training, I was going to talk about Vietnamization, I was going to talk about how the war was being fought, about the bad senior leadership, and uh, uh, so when it came to, to uh, filming it, uh, I had my uh, act together. A guy named Howard Tuckner from ABC, and his uh, and, uh, uh, Nick George, uh, who was the ABC bureau chief. I think uh, uh, probably keeping me alive because the Army became immediately angry and uh, a lot of funny things happened to me. And uh, Nick George just simply assigned a camera team and a, and a, and a uh, uh, narrator to me. The ABC people 
uh, had been uh, asking me for about three months to do this interview, and I was trying to weigh up uh, whether I wanted to uh, pay the price uh, or go to War College and get a star and go onward. Ward Jast wrote a book uh, called Military Men. I don't know if you remember that book. And there was a chapter in there called The Colonel. It didn't mention me by name, but it, and he tried to, to, to shape me so you couldn't, uh, like he made me five foot nine and, and uh, changed my uh, appearance a bit and so on. Uh, but uh, among the media, they knew that that was David Hackworth. So, uh, and they knew those words were mine and they could feel the anger. And what they were trying to do is, is get me to, to be the first senior guy to sound off. And uh, in retrospect, I'm glad I did it. I, I, I'm sure that uh, I uh, caused us to get out of that mess a little bit earlier. The reaction to the military, the current military uh, that's uh, running things right in your town, has been very favorable. They allowed me, first of all, General Bagnell, who commands the Western a command out in the Pacific invited me out there to talk on my Vietnam experience, to talk about how to fight the guerrilla to his commanders and staff. I visited the 25th Division, the 7th Division by invitation of their commanders. I visited the uh, National Training Center. Uh, so I think that the, uh, I'm, I'm actually rather surprised that they're letting somebody who had once uh, gave them a good blast in the nose back. But uh, I think that they think that uh, there are some good lessons learned in this book, and, that, and they can learn something from me. So uh, uh, they've forgiven me, and uh, I, I've forgiven them. And remember, the guys running the Army today weren't the generals in Vietnam. They were the majors who were mumbling and grumbling and bitching and moaning just like I was. They knew the truth. The book, About Face, The Odyssey of an American Warrior, Colonel David H. Hackworth, U.S. Army retired, and Julie Sherman, Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure.